Hi, everyone, and welcome to this CPE webcast, Cybersecurity for the Tax Practitioner. This 50-minute session is brought to you by CPAPracticeAdvisor.com and Drake Software. Drake was founded in 1977, offers software solutions to more than 70,000 tax and accounting firms, and, and together they file more than 36 million tax returns per year. Drake's really well known for its customer service and it's actually uh, come in first place consistently in several categories in CPA Practice Advisors uh, Reader's Choice Awards. My name is Isaac O'Bannon. I'm managing editor of CPA Practice Advisor and I'll be your moderator today. I've worked with technology, CPAs and tax professionals for more than 25 years. The CPA Practice Advisor was founded in 1991 and provides digital print video podcasts and other resources and news for tax and accounting professionals. Now, before we get started, let me explain how you get CPE credit for this webcast. The webcast is 50 minutes and it is worth one credit of CPE in the field of tax. I'm sorry, I had to look that up twice. <laughs> um, during the webcast, we will display three polling questions and in each poll, you will need to record an answer. This is how we verify that you're still watching and engaged with the, pod, with the webcast. After the event, you'll be presented with a post-event evaluation survey. This survey is optional, but you must submit it even if it's blank because it is a part of receiving CPE. Once you submit the evaluation button, your CPE certificate will be sent to the email that you use to register for this webcast. Also note that we can give CPE credit to more than one professional if you've got two or more professionals watching with you. And during the webcast, you can ask questions in the field on your screen, and the speakers will try to get to as many as they can during the presentation, but if they can't, they may follow up with you afterwards by email. The learning objectives for this webcast are to understand the cyber risks and the, I'm sorry, to understand the cyber risks that accounting and tax firms face regarding client and firm data, to identify the legal and regulatory obligations when it comes to client data security, and to learn how to develop data security practices, including a WISP. Today, I'm joined by Jared Ballou and Ann Campbell. Ann is a CPA in private practice, and she's a certified internal auditor and also a trainer at Drake Software. Jared Ballou is the 2022 and 23 chair of ETAC and vice president of government and industry relations at Taxwell, which is the parent company of Drake Software. And so, guys, I think we're ready to begin. Jared? Thank you, Isaac, so much for the introductions. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, and ultimately, our goal with this webcast, and, and I've got my colleague Ann with me here today. I'm excited to be able to co-present with her, uh, is to really get into some of the weeds, right, of what is a written information security plan? What does cybersecurity really look like for practitioner? You know, uh, and so with that, I want to kind of set the table for everyone and explain, you know, why do we even have a written information security plan? How did it come about? And what are some? Where can I go to get some of the tools uh, to develop one for my office? So first, let's talk a little bit about uh, up on the slide here. It has a little bit about who I am, uh, and if you'll notice, it says the IR Security Summit. Uh, many of you've probably heard uh, if you've been in the tax industry for any point of time. Uh, the Security Summit, where we come together as software providers, as practitioners like yourselves, as State Departments of Revenue and the IRS, and we really work to be able to combat identity theft, tax refund fraud. Um, but in that Security Summit, there's actually a group that's made up of practitioners of, like yourselves, um, where we can talk about what are some of the security impacts, what are some of the security standards uh, that are being developed and implemented for practitioners practitioner's office. And out of that group over the last couple of years, we've been looking at what type of, of documents or standards can we set. Many years ago, historically, um, I would probably say close to six or seven years ago, um, the Security Summit stood up a document many may have seen before called the Pub 4557. We'll talk about that today, um, which talks about protecting and safeguarding data. Uh, and then also out of that group, 
uh, came the document which we're going to talk about today, which is the written information security plan. So as a whole, that's where this conversation started. That's where these documents have come out of. And again, written by you and for you. And again, obviously the IRS has taken them and made them publications, which makes them uh, kind of that, that floor, that baseline today. And so before I jump into the session, is there anything, Ann, you'd like to share before we, we get started today? Um, um, I guess the main thing that people may or may not realize, besides, the fact, I mean, truly every tax preparer has to have a WISP, even right. if you're just a sole practitioner who does it part-time. Yeah. And that's really, really the good point here that, um, you know, we, we sit here and we say, well, I only moonlight. I only have, you know, my family's returns and a few friends, right? Um, the thing is, it applies. It applies to you. It applies to the big firms. And so today we want to make sure that we can di make it digestible for you. Um, you don't have to be the best security expert in, a, in the room or on the planet, but we can show you a way to have one and ready to go uh, in case uh, you need to activate it. So let's jump with that. We're going to jump right into kind of the first slide here real quick. And the first slide, um, as I begin developing some of these security talks and I work with practitioners across the country, uh, we kind of understood that through the pandemic, there was a whole lot that's changed, right? How we interact with our taxpayers or our customers fundamentally changed through the pandemic. We were primarily used to having customers coming into our offices, them handing off documents, and some, and some of that is still there today. But we wanted to say, you know, as a tax office, how did you fare? How did you weather the pandemic as far as being able to exchange or communicate with your taxpayers? And, and over this past year, one of the things that we saw, which was really heartening to see, is that, um, you know, most of the practitioners are still using Email. That's that's way our customers are accessing us. The next one was phone. You know, we're seeing them coming in. That, that's important, right? Because we want to establish how our customers communicating with us. But ultimately, how are you communicating and sending documents back to your customers, or how are they actually getting documents to you? And one of the things that we saw here was that you're actually doing a really good job. We've seen a big switch from people handing things off in paper or taking it directly through email and they're yell averaging things called like your uh, portals or secure portals, which is very good. It's hardening to know that you guys are, are taking that up and you're, you're, you're actually using secure mechanisms to send documents back and forth. But what we also recognize is that, and I have these two as customers, Anne can probably attest to this in, in her practice is that, we don't always get to choose the method that our customers send us documents. Sometimes, you know, I'm going to get someone that's going to text me something uh, and I'm going to get a picture of something You're like, stop, stop, stop. Or, you know, they're going to send it in an email. And so the more that we can drive traffic and we can set the stage for our customers, for the taxpayers that interact with us um, to utilize secure methods, uh, it's important. And, and why is that? Why is it important to consider all the channels and the mediums that uh, our customers choose to interact with us on? Well, the biggest thing is, is data, right? And that's why we're here today. How do we protect the data that a taxpayer is sending back and forth to us? Well, the fraudsters see you right, as a tax practitioner, as a treasure trove. It's, it's, it's different from, um, let's say, just a regular taxpayer getting their, their computer breached. You know, it's, that's just their records and their information. But as a tax pro, you're holding social security numbers, birth certificates, driver's licenses. And so someone who is able to breach or, or um, get behind a practitioner's um, data trove, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to mean tax fraud. They, if they have driver's license, they can go out and, cre uh, and and open up bank accounts. They can go and open up all these different accounts in people's names. So losing someone's identity, which you have access to all those authentication documents, is important to make sure that we secure it. And, and there are some rules behind it that we're going to talk about today as well. So again, understanding that that's kind of the rule number one is understanding where we're getting the data from and how that data um, is secured is what we want to start talking about. So as we did our results and kind of the, the, the bigger picture here, when we talk about data breach statistics, is it how bad is it, right? Uh, one of the things I talked to people about is that, you know, this past year, there were about 8.8 .8 billion, 8 .8 billion lost in scams. And that goes even beyond just the tax realm or the tax world. But what we're seeing that uh, here is that it's not just the older populace. You know, we sometimes we hear, you know, my grandparents or my parents lost the data. They fell prey to the scam. We're actually seeing a, a pretty even split here uh, between the younger generations and the older. It just so happens that the younger tend to lose it more often. It's just because they're a little more careless with the information that they have. Uh, they're engaging in a lot of more social media platforms. Uh, their, their exposure is greater, whereas the older generation is 
they're not losing it as frequently, but when they have a breach, they're not catching it as fast, and therefore they're losing a lot more information over a longer period of time. But irregardless, uh, we've seen that millennials, which is interesting, are actually sharing passwords a lot more than even the older generation, which is which is interesting to see. Uh, I know many people, uh, you know, they'll share their their Netflix or their Hulu passwords. And why does that matter? Why does that matter? How does this apply to, to tax practices? Well, the, the issue here is that a lot of people reuse passwords and usernames. Um, what they put for their favorite movie channel or streaming service, they also put to get into their software. And today's age, um, if you lose a password, uh, let's say you typed it in for your Target account or Walmart account, and that gets breached, what criminals can do is they can run that username and password through their systems and their algorithms so fast that they can run through thousands of different login pages to test if that username and password is used elsewhere, right? And so therefore, it doesn't necessarily even have to be your machine at first that gets breached. Um, it could be lost somewhere else and they can use it and test it and find out and ultimately gain more information and back kind of backtrack their way into your system. So understanding that password management, we'll talk about hygiene a little bit later. But one of the things I want to talk about and kind of leave the impression here is when we talk about average time to identify a breach, many of us are not uh, IT or security professionals, and we're tax professionals. But the average time for someone to actually say, I, I know there's a problem, I see there's a problem, I identify a problem in my office, that means the criminals on average been there 277 days. And the way I relate this to uh, practitioners is if have you ever had that customer that brought in that shoebox, right? That just stack of receipts that are messy and crazy. And you're like, how is this possible? Yeah. How, how, how can you do this? Like, how are you living your life and running a successful business? Right? We, we've all seen those guys. If you were a tax pro and you got to go sit in their office for 277 days and had unfettered access to how they did their records and everything else, I bet you'd have a pretty good idea how they did things and why things are the way they are, right? You have a really good yeah. idea. It's the same thing for these criminals, right? They're sitting there on your devices, your machines, and, and most of the guys that get in uh, or that breach your system, they're probably not even the ones that are going to be using the information. Their whole job is to go out, get into machines, harvest as much information and learn what is this computer? What is this business? What are they holding? They then classify the data and then sell it on the black market or, or dark web, right? And so understanding that these guys that are sitting there, um, people always ask me, you know, your backups. Well, I've got everything backed up. Well, guess what? They know you have it backed up too, and they've watched you back it up, and they know where those backups are. If it's connected to the system and, you know, so we'll, we'll talk about hygiene later. But understanding that most of the time when, when there's some sort of takeover or breach, um, they know a whole lot about you. And then there's even more time to actually contain and clean up. And, and uh, one of the things that we've seen uh, this year as it pertains to practitioners in the Security Summit is that we've seen a whole lot of ransomware beginning to take place. And what that means is these bad guys are coming into your system and they're locking it out. They're going to encrypt all the files or password protect them or, or make them where you can't get access to them. Um, and they say, you're going to you know, send me uh, this much Bitcoin to this crypto wallet. Um, send me, you know, an Apple cards or whatever type of payment they wanted in, and they'll lock your system out and say, we will unlock it or we'll erase it. Well, we've seen a twist this year, actually. The cyber criminals are getting really, really good at knowing you're a tax pro, and that tax pros rely on their relationship. Um, they're very tied into their communities. They're very trusted. And so they've actually gone into the blackmail side of things. So they'll get into your system, lock it out, and they'll say, if you don't pay this ransom, we're going to go to your local news. We're going to go to your local paper. We're going to go to um, your local attorney general or your state attorney general. We're going to show that you've been breached and we're going to put this out in the press and news and we're going to destroy your image. Um, it, it's been something we've seen as a new twist specifically targeting tax press. So um, what we want to do today and the whole goal of this is, A, prevent ever that happening by putting some really good practices in place. And the WISP itself, the document that it is, it's just a collection of items that helps you become more aware of your systems, your computers, where your data is. That's really the goal of this WISP. Um, and I won't continue reading this slide too much more, but really what we want to point out is that um, we need to start thinking about how we connect. And, and Anne and I were talking about this, Isaac and I were talking about this just before this started, is that we need to be thinking about who connects to our networks, who connects to our offices or our internet. Because one in three, one in three home computers are infected with malicious software. So we have uh, over 550 uh, guests here today, right? One third of you, your home computer has malware on it. Think about that. 
Um, and when we start thinking about our grandkids, right, who don't think about cybersecurity whatsoever, we think about our children, they don't care about cybersecurity. Let's just download it. Let's install it, right? When you allow people in or you're even your, your customers on your networks at home or at work and they're using their personal devices, they can bring the bad actors in, even if you're doing everything right. But if you let a device that's infected in, um, that, again, it's just something we need to be aware of. And we'll talk about how we do that. And did you have a comment there? I, I, I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um well, like you, you touched on it, you know, somebody like me who's a sole practitioner, you know, if I'm in my home office, then who's allowed to be on my network? You know, like you were saying, like, oh, the, the kids have friends over and they're all watching yeah. Netflix and they're on, they want to do it on their, you know, that password is now to access my system, my Wi-Fi, my, you know, network is is in the hands of somebody else. So we in my in my case i have it split i have a, my stuff is only on only i can access it but um the other thing you mentioned on this slide was talking about the ransomware where th that little twist is so important because before when you thought about ransomware you thought well you know i've got everything backed up so i don't care because i don't they can't shut me down i'll just <laughs> get a new computer and you know, start again. But as a tax professional, you know, your reputation is everything. It's, right. it's, you know, if, if I had to explain to clients that their data was breached, I probably wouldn't have certain clients anymore. But the worst part is if, if for me, it's my own data is on there. Yeah. So I would do my own taxes. So my data is on there and probably like everybody else, you know, there's family data on there. So I don't want to explain to my parents, hey, your data has been compromised. Yeah. You know, but that's not that's not a nice conversation to have. So absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that, that's the biggest thing is they understand that even if you don't pay them, that they can still go out and just burn your reputation. And it, it's no. Well, right? and, and, and paying them is not going to be a one time thing. It's the gift that keeps right. on giving. That's correct. You There's no honesty. among not going to do anything after you give them. So make yeah. that a monthly budget amount if, if you're going to do that. Yeah, no yeah. honor and honesty among thieves. You're exactly right. Just because you pay them doesn't mean they're just going to get it back and they're not going to sell it again. So yeah, great, great points. And and beyond ransomware, right? Uh, when we start talking about how do breaches occur and we start talking about like, well, how are they even getting into my device? Well, there's a couple of things that we saw through statistics. Um, one of those, like I said, is compromised credentials. I already covered that one. The biggest one, that I really want to kind of push out here to all of you professionals and say, where do I start? Where do I begin? If you take away nothing else from this whole webcast, it's that you need to protect your email. The number one way that criminals are getting into your system, these bad actors are getting into your system and your offices and they're taking over your data, it's through your email. Um, they're sending you some sort of phishing email, some sort of malicious thing in an email, um, and you are letting them in by clicking on it. A an employee is letting them in by clicking on it. And we'll talk about how we, we alleviate that. But understand, you know, it it's hard. As a tax pro, I get it. You know, we're going to get those emails in season where someone says, hey, I'm a new person. I was referred to you. Um, here's my prior year tax return. Can you take a look at it? And they attach a PDF, right? Um that's, that's very common. We, we see that all the time uh, in the tax world. And that PDF could be malicious and it could have some, when you open it up, it could open up and then run a malicious code. So one of the things and the tips I'm gonna give you right here is building practices around your email that are secure. You can take that document. You can have a folder called a, you know, a to be scanned file. It can be downloaded into that folder. As long as it's not been opened, no, no virus has been executed. And you can right click on it using your antivirus and scan it before you ever open it. It's just a small practice that you can do and say, this is a policy we're gonna do. And we'll talk about policies later. But again, being very smart with your email. If you can protect your email, you reduce your attack service. And more often than not, nine times out of 10, you will never have a breach in your office because that is the main vector. That is it on how they're getting into your system. It's not this just kind of wild west of someone's looking for you and they find you know, your office out of nowhere, thin air, right? Uh, they're sending a wide, wide broad net 
Um, they're trying to catch anyone, and generally it comes in the form of an email. So thinking about that, uh, the other one would be you know your, your cloud configurations. Are you using cloud to store stuff? And then third parties, like other softwares that you buy, um, other companies or things you have installed, uh, making sure those are up to date, you know, attack vectors. We've seen that through the government and in other areas. So anyway, I won't spend much time there. Let's talk about the WISP. But we're coming to our first question before we even jump in. Andy, you want to read the question, and we're going to have a poll that will be sure. brought up for you guys. Okay. So the first polling question is, is a WISP required for your tax firm? And you can answer on the screen, I believe. Yes. So that yeah. should populate. I'll let you guys go ahead and answer that. We'll, we'll pause for just a second. Yeah. All right. As those answers are coming in. <clears throat> And the answer for that question, as we'll close the poll here in about two seconds, is that yes. And I think Anne, Anne really answered that at the very beginning for us. And we, we talked about that. Hopefully you paid attention right at the beginning. It right. is required for all tax practitioners. Um, even no matter, just a sole practitioner, right? Even yeah. just a sole. Those, exactly. those third people who didn't answer yes, please listen. <laughs> exactly. We're, we're about to jump into it. All right. <laughs> Let's move into our next section. So. Let's talk about the WISP. So where do you get started? How do you even begin to build one? Well, here's what I tell people. Go ahead, and if you have something to write with, if you have notes to take down, understand that there are three main columns. Let's, let's call them columns, right? And they are physical security that we need to look at and investigate and document. There's technical columns, things that we need to document and investigate, and then administrative, okay? So let's jump into the first one here real quick our physical security. So as a practitioner, if I've written down a column to create my WISP, I need to look at what am I doing to physically secure the data from theft, someone coming in. So let's let's take cyber out of it. Let's take these big bad criminals out. Let's look at your neighborhood. I walk to my door. There's a lock on my door. Okay, great. So I have put a lock between me and my information. From the outside world and my information, I need to write that down in my WISP. I need to say, I have a lock on my front door. I have a security system. I have a pit bull that guards it 24-7. Whatever you want to call your security, your physical security. I have locks on filing cabinets. They're stored in a, in a back um, storage room. Um, all the physical security things, anything you can touch, right? That's physical security and making sure the data isn't being stolen. So that's pretty simple. We've already just completed one third, really, of our, of our WISP requirements here is saying we've, we've, we've looked at what we have physically touching it, how people can physically get in and steal the information, steal the machines, and I've secured it. The next thing I want to talk about is technical. All right, so let's dive one layer deeper. And, and this is kind of where I think some pros go, hands off. Oh, no, oh no what? I, don't, I don't know this. I'm a tax pro. I'm not a, I'm not a tech expert. Let me put it this way. What I want you guys to do, and I've done this at Dyer's Forums, but in this room, what I would tell you to do is just like look to your left and your right. You don't have to be the best. You just have to be better than the person on your left and right. The tax office down the street, you just have to be better than them, faster than your, in a bear attack, faster than your friend, right? That's really what you want to think about is creating an, a, a, a space where it's just a little bit more friction uh, than they want to overcome to be able to get your data and they move on to the next guy. You know, that's our only goal. What does that mean? Okay. Well, it means... Do you have an antivirus installed? Oh, Jared, antivirus. Well, what, what do I need to do there about antivirus? Well, it's pretty simple, actually, right? Um, anything that's not free. This is a simple answer for you, right? Anything that's not free. Why is that important? Um, it's simply that when you buy or when you download free products, you are the product. Right, they're leveraging you and your information as the product. Also, it means updates, right? When I buy an antivirus software and I pay for the subscription, um, bad guys are always changing their attack algorithms, their, their programs. And for those companies to update those definitions, those virus definitions to protect against it, they give it to their paid subscription first, right? And so there's no guarantee of getting updates on a free software. So making sure you're up to date with a paid software subscription goes a long way in protecting you against these uh, bad actors. Firewalls, making sure you have them, whether that is a hardware or software, just making sure you have antivirus and firewall. Those are two good things to have in place. Another third thing that you can think about, which kind of pairs into the physical protection, um, is encrypting your hard drive. And that can sound scary, right? It's actually not. Um, on your devices, you can right click on your hard drive and Microsoft allows you to right click and say encrypt. What does that mean? It just means that when your data is on your hard drive and the machine powers off, it is encrypted. It means that it's password protected and hashed so that if someone were to steal your machine and run out the door with it, 
pull the hard drive out of it and try and plug it in somewhere else or turn it on or boot it up, they wouldn't be able to use the data on it, right? So there's a physical protection and a technical protection. What it means is that when you log in with your username and password, it then unencrypts the hard drive, right? And the data is unencrypted right then. So again, it's just a little thing that you can do and you can document that you have it and you're protecting against a physical theft by encrypting it when the drive is off. Pretty cool. So again, these are all just little things that you can do. You don't have to be the expert. You don't have to be the best. And this is where you can actually go out and hire a tech expert. I, I tell people all the time, there's no shame in hiring an expert, but I would tell you more often than not, like, well, my nephew knows a lot about this. My cousin knows a lot about this. I'm sure they do. Um, but if you can, and if you're not comfortable, I would, I would definitely have someone who is does this for a living, uh, come in and, and, and build these things out for you just, just for that security. Because at the end of the day, I know we're trying to save money, but how much is your reputation worth? Uh, and if a breach occurs, um, you're, you're going to see here, and I think it showed the amount, how many have a million dollars to resolve a, a phishing or a, a, a ransomware attack? Most of practitioners don't, right? Uh, so we need to be aware of that. The, the third thing, the third pillar, we're going to move on here into administrative safeguards. And this is one we often forget, is that we need to train and we need to teach those in our office if we have someone that's helping us. The, basically, the um, severity uh, of the sensitive information that they're handling, right? We need to make sure that we go in and, and that we teach them about their devices. We teach them about good hygiene and practices. We teach them about, you know, how we store stuff. Talking about email. Most often, when I say safeguard your email, um, most people do not delete emails in their inbox. They go through, the customer will send them a W-2. They come in and they just download it, but they leave the email there because you know they want a history to go back and reference. But if something ever happened to your email, if it got breached, you know, let's say it got breached accidentally somehow, well, the criminal can just go scroll through your inbox and download all those documents. You can so so as a practitioner, a good habit is clean out your inbox, download the document in your document manager where you have it, keep it there, keep it safe in your protected system, but keep your inbox clean, keep your email not in the storage cabinet. Yeah. Hey, Jared, there's, um, I'm not sure if it's available in like Outlook, but I know that a lot of document management systems, and I'm sure it's in, in Drake as well as some of the others, have, uh, you can automate destruction of files after X time. After so some, some firms, it's recommended you do it after three years, seven years. But if it's sensitive emails, you know, maybe those should be deleted automatically after a month or, or less. I, I don't know if you have best practice. No, that's that's great. And you know, honestly, what it is is documenting exactly what you said, Isaac, right? right? So setting a policy in place to say that emails come in. So if an issue occurs, you can reference your WISP that says all of my emails as of this, you know, they are deleted after 30 days, 100 days, a year, whatever you want to set the date at. But that's up to you and your risk tolerance, right? So I'm going to get into that in a second, talking about risk, because everyone says, is this better? Or is that better? How many days? It comes down to you as a, as a practitioner when we talk about risk, right? And you have to be able to accept certain levels of risk. Um, think about it like this. Think about it as I'm a practitioner. Someone comes to me and they talk about uh, depreciation or assets. And they say, well, should I do this? Should I section 179 this? Should I do that? And you say, well, it depends. Depends on what you want to do with your business. That depends on how you want to accomplish this. Your job is to then let them know what decisions they want to make. Same, same thing here. My job here is just to say, there is no right answer. Each office is different. We all run differently, have different needs. Ultimately, it's about knowing your risk, identifying it, and then taking steps to document it. That's, that's what all this is about, right? There's no silver bullet that saves us all. Um, but it's a really good point that, that you brought up that, that there are tools out there to auto destroy or auto uh, delete, uh, archive, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Right. And, and I'd like to add a couple things on this. Um, <laughs> on this slide, I always laugh when it says manage and train your staff. Well, don't forget to train the boss because typically they're, they're the ones who aren't thinking, you know, they don't know how to use a scanner or a shredder or, you know, the copier. They, they also need to be trained. Um, usually in my experience, they're the worst offenders. Um, they mingle personal and business stuff in their emails and whatever. They don't know how to go in and delete things. But it, even when you delete an email, then is it sitting in your trash? And how often does your trash get emptied? Yeah. Um, 
if you have a, uh, like let's say you have um, a third party email service like I do, and I, you know, pull in that stuff into Outlook um, on my own local computers, but that data is still up in the cloud right. also. So I have to like, you know, just like you do with, you know, you get somebody who just can't understand that they shouldn't send you an unencrypted or unpassworded, you know, W2 via PDF. You know, I, I have to go in two places. I go into obviously my Outlook and then I also delete it from the trash after I've, of course, taken the data to my portals or my documents. But I also have to remember to go to the to the cloud service to do it. Sure. So that's just one of those things um, to remember yeah. if you do download to Outlook. Yeah, great, great points. And, you know, Anna Isaac, one thing I always uh, ask people is, you know, we talked about ransomware earlier. And does anybody even know? Do you guys know how these guys are getting away with it? Whenever they're doing this ransomware stuff, you, you know how they're getting away? Mm -hmm. I can give you a simple answer. Everybody ready? Wait for it. Bitcoin they ran somewhere. Let that sink in. All right. I can't hear the moans and groans from the 500, but I know they're there for that joke. All right. We're staying awake. We're moving along. Uh, let's talk about cyber hygiene. What does that mean? How do I apply that into my practice? Well, let's jump in real quick. And Ann, you just alluded to this. This was, this was a beautiful segue, I think, separating personal and business. And you're right. The bosses are the number one offenders for this one right here. And I'm a big offender sometimes when it because, you know, I've had my practice forever. You probably had your practice forever. You had your, your old AOL, Juno, whatever, email address. That's where your customers have always contacted you. You don't want to separate, but here's the deal. If you can separate your personal emails and personal life, the ones you're going shopping and you're getting your ads and advertisements, you're getting all this stuff too from what you're doing in your business, you're reducing the attack space or we call it attack vector or surface area that, that, that these guys are coming through. And you know that the only thing coming to this email that I even care about, right, is about my business. And so therefore you're less likely to kick, click on something that's a phishing email or something that looks suspicious. Well, I don't shop with this account, so it's not coming here. That looks odd. I'm not doing this. That looks odd, right? My, my family doesn't send me stuff to this account because this is my business account. We've seen it where criminals have uh, have tried to attack me personally. I do a lot of security talks, right? And they'll, they'll try and spoof an email from one of my family members say, hey, look, your nephew had this picture, blah, blah, blah. Isn't he so cute? You can go and if you clicked on it, if I clicked on it, it was actually a virus and it was spoofed address, not, you know, like from my actual family members. So again, there are people that try and leverage those personal feelings and those relationships, those, this, whenever we're, we're, we let our guard down with our family or our friends or our shopping, right? That's when, it, that's when bad things occur. So we can always be on guard with our business. Well, let's separate those things as best we can. So be thinking of how you can separate. Another thing, and you've been killing it today, Wi-Fi networks, man. That's a big thing. People don't realize you can, in your office, on your router, again, log in and you can have a guest network and you can have a work network. It's just a matter of turning it on. And, and setting it up so that if you want to give someone access to the internet, they are not actually on your network. And it's a free thing you can do. Um, it's very simple to set up. Employee devices, it's another thing to consider. Again, a lot of small practices here may not have the ability to you know, own a device and give it to your employee and say, hey, only use this for work or whatever purpose. Uh, but that's a, that's a risk thing you want to consider. If there's an employee and they're bringing their own device, um, can that device connect to my business network? The answer should be no, right, if it's a personal device. Uh, web searching. These are all free things you can do too. Web searching. Um, I personally have a practice. It's called whitelisting. You can set this up on your router. You turn it on. And what that means, it says it shuts the internet off, internet off completely. And the only websites I can visit are the ones I specifically type in like irs.gov or I type in my state department of revenue or my research tool or my software company. And that way, when I'm at work, the only addresses my machine can go out to are those companies that I specify. And so that can even protect you from the sense of, if I'm in an email and I click on something or an employee clicks on something and it sends them to a bad link or a bad address, it can't get out, it can't go there. Even if they made a mistake, you could prevent them from actually even getting to the bad site that would download the virus, right? It so seems like they'd be really good for like small firm owners and home office users oh, who yeah. are trying to train themselves or their, their credit. You know, if, if you're trying to stop commingling your communication, right? This computer is for work, and yeah. I don't even 
I shouldn't even have my personal computer in here because it'll be too tempting. Let's move it over into the other room. Yeah. Besides that, that room is only used for business, right? I, right. I'm not a tax pro. I can joke about that. Um, <laughs> but but if, but if you're trying to really train yourself to do that, if if that is how you've got your work computer, the one that has access to your client data files, your personal tax data, and yeah. and other information, then it does not need to go to YouTube. Right. Just doesn't. Right. And it breaks you of those habits too, because a lot of it is habit based, right? We're just so used to searching here, going here, shopping there, and, and we do it without thinking. So you're absolutely right. It's a great trainer, right? Um, and so it, it's easy to do, it's cost effective, it's quick, um, and, and it's really, really effective at keeping things safe. So something I just want to throw out there, and we'll keep it moving. Uh, the other one I talk about cyber hygiene, and I know this is some, somewhat new, is location sharing. Um, people don't think about where their devices are connected or microphones and cameras. You know, the other day I, I came home from work and you know, I walked through the door to go say hi to my wife. And I, I walk in, I go, hey, babe, how's it going? You know, I started whispering and, and everything I was saying was whispering. And she looks at me like I was crazy. She's like, what, what are you doing? And I said, well, I don't want the I don't want, you know, the big tech companies to hear what I'm saying and to steal my data. And, you know, she laughed. I laughed. Oh, Alexa yes, laughed. Man. We all laughed. We all had a really good laugh about it. But uh, it's true that devices that you put in your office um, that listen, your Alexas, your Google Homes, those things that creature comforts, those aren't meant for business settings because a lot of information is being stored in the cloud and where you can't, you can't for sure say, are they collecting this information? Are they storing? Are they doing the right thing by it? Right. And so we in the business need to be thinking about what's connected to our network, automated backups. And you can, you hit this again. The bad guys, once they get in, they see where your automated backups are going. They will steal that too. They will encrypt that too. Um, one that I have that I, you know, I, I had never thought of a long time ago was um, I love taking pictures of my kids. And I don't want those pictures lost forever. And even when I get a new device, I want to make sure they're backed up to the cloud, make sure they're, they're stored out there. Well, like I said before, a taxpayer sends you a W-2, sends you a birth certificate, sends you a social security card, and they text it to you. Well, all of a sudden it's on my phone. Now it's into my automatic photo backups. Well, I didn't think about it. Well, that's not protected here, or I don't understand. I've been sent PII out into a cloud, right? That, and, and it's being stored out there. So again, we need to be cognizant. What are we using on our devices? Where is our data going? Where is it being stored, right? Again, protecting the data. It doesn't mean it's being breached at that moment, but if an account was breached, what would they gain access to? Internet of Things is another one um, that I talk about. What does that mean? We all love creature comforts. Uh, this is like where I can connect my coffee machine. I can connect uh, my microwave. I can connect all these different things, my sensors, door sensors. I can connect all these things to my network to make my life easier. Um, those Internet of Things have the capability to be breached if they're not updated uh, appropriately. They do take regular updates, making sure anything that's connected to your network is regularly updated. It's really important to do that. Um, I'll give you one, one little story. We'll move on from here. Um, we'll really start digging into the WISP. But uh, there was a case where an IRS CI agent pulled up to this uh, larger CPA firm. There are a couple of partners in it. And uh, they pull up and said, we think you've been breached. And let me just tell you this right now, as a practitioner, if an IRS CI comes to your office and they knock on your door and they say, we think you've been breached, <clears throat> don't fight them. They, they know you've been breached. At that point, they, they, they're they not guessing. That was, they were being nice to you, right? And so they didn't agree. They didn't think so. Uh, through many, many, many different rounds, IRS proved to them um, that they had. And what had happened was one of the partners late at night was trying to print. The big copier machine went down. It wasn't working. They had to get it done. So they went to the back office. They found this old printer. They got it. They plugged it in. They printed the return. They went home. Fine. Well, they didn't unplug the printer. They didn't unplug the old printer. It had been years and years and years out of date. There had actually been a security flaw that needed to be patched on it. And the bad guys are actually able to get in through that security hole in that printer and breach their entire network, steal all of their tax uh, customers' records, um, not just that one partners, but the whole firms. And so it's a sad story. But again, this is about making us think, what's connected? Am I using it? Do I even need it connected to my network anymore? Answer is no. If you're not using it, you don't need it. Limit your attack surface, right? So that's it's kind of been the theme of what we talked about. Now, beyond beyond email phishing, beyond all these other things, I do want to bring up three other quick little attack surfaces that I think we need to be cognizant of in the tax world. Uh, just again, beyond email, one is called vishing, and that's 
we understand it. It's people calling you, pretending to be someone else and get information out of you. Um, we see this more often. I, I, I kind of predict this is going to be on the rise for us um, just because of AI. There's been a study out where these uh, bad actors can call your phone, listen to your voicemail, and they can collect enough of an audio sample in your voicemail to be able to replicate your voice for a full um, AI, AI model, right? So they can pretend to be anybody they want with just a short clip and sample, right? So we, as AI gets better, you know, I think vishing is going to increase. Smishing is just, you know, with your text messaging, we see it all the time. I got one actually this morning that says, you know, hey, how are you? It doesn't know who I am, some number, right? They're just trying to get at you with your text. Be careful of it. Crishing is the other one that I think is probably the most dangerous uh, up and comer. Through the pandemic, we all probably had our favorite restaurant that, uh, you know, we had that menu, we loved it, and that menu disappeared. And you have to go now and you have to do what? You have to scan a QR code to be able to get that menu. Scan the QR code to get this. Well, what we need to understand about QR codes is they're not they're not benign, like the little barcode you see on grocery stores anymore. QR codes are very, very, very powerful. They can actually contain an entire virus within one QR code. Um, so you scanning just any random QR code can actually could actually uh, contaminate that device. And if you bring that device into your network, they've got into your network. And so all that being said, the IRS is using QR codes. We're seeing revenue departments using QR codes. Are QR codes bad? We use QR codes, Drake does. Are they bad? No, QR codes aren't bad. They're, they're very useful. They're very helpful. They help us get to places by providing direct access. Um, but what we have to understand is understand your source. Understand that they are powerful that they can produce harm if they're bad actors using them. But ultimately, we need to stop and think before we do, right? So do you know who this is coming from? Yes, I can use it. Same thing with text messaging. Do I know who's sending it to me? Same thing with emailing. If the customer I've never met before sends me a PDF, I should probably call them, call a phone number, get to know them. Um, if, I, if there's one address, if there's not a phone number, that's probably a red flag, right? Um, so all of these things, email, it's not bad. We use it, but you have to stop think what can happen by using these technology mediums. Um, so we're going to move on to our next question. We're, we're getting there. Ann, you want to read this question hey. for me? Okay. Second polling question. Uh, do you have a WISP for your firm? And answer on the screen. And as, as you guys are answering, um, this will remind you that these little devices that we hold in our hand every day are very powerful. And when you get a new phone, be careful, you know, I was just in the store the other day getting a new phone and the, the tech is just like, oh, let me just set it up for you. And he's scrolling through and I'm like, stop. And I go through every question when they set it up because of course, what are they gonna do? They wanna, you know, be able to watch you, what you do and the tracking and everything. And it's not just, you have to accept it all, you don't. But the other thing that came up, which I found interesting was, you know, in this question, the answer is no. And in this question, the answer is yes. Like in it's, you know, they, they switch it off because they want to trick you basically, in my opinion. Yeah. And it's very frustrating to think how much information they can gather. And, and you can go back and change your settings on your phones, but it's obviously harder to do after you've signed up. So be well, they want to sell you, they want to sell you product and the more information right. they have about you, it's just like Alexa. Alexa doesn't care what you're doing. It just wants to know what you're doing That's so that right. it can so that it can schedule you for delivery. Yeah. Right. Well, and I will say this, you guys, you know, as, as we finish up this polling question, you know, tax professionals, you guys are you guys are incredible. In fact, I'm gonna classify you as superheroes, probably even better than than Superman. Um, I actually thought about this, right? So Superman would never ever be a tax practitioner. Did you guys know that? He never would be. Um, he couldn't be. He, he actually couldn't because he's he's afraid of cryptocurrency. It's a it's a fact. And you guys are just jumping right in there. You're learning the new stuff. It doesn't affect you. Anyway, all right. We're waking up here. We're moving into our first, our third and final leg here. I uh, want to make sure you're awake. Uh, let's talk about your obligations. This is really kind of the where the rubber hits the road here. What are our obligations? Well, there's three main areas here as a practitioner. One, the Gramlich Bliley Act, which we're going to learn about real quick. Two, what are the resources you can do to meet your obligations? That's Pub 4557. So these are on irs.gov, publication 4557, which is safeguarding your data, and Pub 5708, which is your written information security plan. So write those down. 
They are available for you. And then the FTC Data Breach Response Guide, uh, that is if something bad would happen, we're gonna cover that in a second and where you can get to it. So let's jump right in. The graham leach Act um, of 1998, uh, passed by Congress, basically said that they wanted to do something to protect taxpayer data in financial institutions. And what they did is they gave the authority to the FTC or the Federal Trade Commission to say, go in and clean this up, clean up safeguarding data. And so the FTC is the oversight authority. And albeit, imagine that, the IRS is actually not the oversight authority on this safeguarding data. It is actually FTC, a little misnomer there. Um, and the FTC went in and said, all right, let's classify financial institutions. So they look at banks, they look at uh, payday lenders, they look at car dealerships, and lo and behold, you as a tax practitioner fall into the same category as a financial institution. So therefore, all the laws and rules of safeguarding data that apply to those financial institutions that we think is traditional financial institutions apply to you. You have to follow the same rules that they do. Now, there are some other exceptions based on size and scope, but understand you're in the same bucket. Now, the FTC outlaid these uh, safeguarding rules, uh, and we'll cover some of those in just a second. Um, but what do we do, um, now that we know who the authority is, what do we do and, and how did the IRS try and bridge that gap, right? So they don't have the authority necessarily to, to say we're the safeguarding of data, but how can they help you? Well, that's what we wrote this Pub 4557, and Pub 4557 does this. It goes through and it says a lot of what I've taught today in the, in the cyber hygiene, it's gonna say, here's how you implement a firewall, an antivirus. Here's how you implement um, some uh, best practices for hygiene uh, of your email. It goes through this whole thing for a tax office. So it's a nice, concise document. At the very bottom of it, it even gives you like a checklist that you can run through. So you say, yes, I've done this. I've gone through and make sure I have locks on my doors. I have antivirus. I have uh, trained my employees. I've done all these different things. And each year you can go through this checklist. Um, so it's a really good document. But in, in the safeguarding rule, right, um, there's a couple of other things that they talk about that we need to be aware of, right? So in 4557, it's going to talk about multi-factor authentication. Ooh, the big word. Uh, we've probably seen this in the past couple of years. Um, your software providers, no matter who you've used, have, when you've installed the software, said, hey, you know, set up your multi-factor authentication using authenticator apps. Um, one of the things that I will tell you, and it's on our next slide, um, is that the FTC had a new ruling as of June 9th this year that says all tax practitioners or financial institutions, right, in covering tax practitioners, must utilize multi-factor authentication in your offices. It's a requirement now as of June 9th. The Security Summit, which I work in and co-chair, you know, we're working to implement those changes into some of the standards and the documents, like your Pub 1345, 4557. Um, but know that that's something that IRS is going to be looking at and, and pushing out there in some of their documentation. Encrypting, right? Something that we don't think about. When you ingest documents, when you get those PDFs or those scans of those pictures, are those documents encrypted? Are they password protected, right? Um, can someone just freely go in and grab them and steal them? The FTC says you need to encrypt them. They need to be in a way that someone can't just openly get to them, access them, open them up, and steal the information that's on them. So um, this is all out on that Pub 4557 on some of the things you need to do to safeguard data. I will say this uh, as we move in through this, the FTC does have a list of requirements. I've distilled them here for you. You can go out on their website and read the Title 16, Section 3.14 dash, you name it, you name it, long, long, long uh, verbiage. But ultimately, these are the main requirements. Is one that you do set up one person to coordinate your information security plan, one person to develop the written information security plan, uh, one person who's responsible, right, in case something happens, um, it comes down. So if you're a single practice office, that's, that's you. you. You can't, you can't hand it off. I can't, out I can't go out there and you can't go out and say, I'm right. going to hire a firm and they're taking on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the liability on this. I'm sorry, partner. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, doesn't work always, that way. Yeah, you can always go out and have someone consult. And, and, and this is yeah. one thing I want to say, and too, is, and we've seen this, people are out there selling these WISPs. They say, we'll go out, we'll build it for you know hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars um, to build this WISP for you. But just letting someone else build it doesn't reduce doesn't your cover. liability, doesn't cover it, right? And just because they build it doesn't mean you're in compliance. If you don't right. understand what's on the WISP, what's in the WISP and how it works, then you're not in compliance, right? So right. just having someone do it for you and paying it to be done doesn't work. It doesn't cover FTC requirements. So right. 
And, and can I just add a comment here too? Yeah. Um, you know, being a sole practitioner again, I actually had my computer expert help me because I wanted to make sure that I really understood that some of the technical things that when you get into the WISP. Um, and the second thing is that somebody, any solo practitioner is going to have this issue. What if something happens to you? Then, you know, your clients are stuck. Maybe right. they can't get their data, whatever. So I, you know, it's not really WISP per se, but you do want to think about that. Like how would somebody help your clients get their data, you know, so. Are you hinting at a last will and testament of tax practitioners or something like that? I don't know. How about just a mutual uh, in case of emergency exactly. uh, compact with, with the non-competitive CPA? That's, there that's, you go. What, that's <laughs> what most people I know do, actually. They, yeah, they, like the solo practitioners I know say, hey, if something did happen to me, you know, unexpectedly, you know, I, I have a plan and, you know, you don't give them your passwords or anything, but there's a, there's a way that your trusted family member could help them get the data and help your clients. Yeah. So. Yeah. So let's jump into this final little piece here talking about, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back real quick. The pub or our 5708. This is the written information security plan. We just talked about, you can go to irs.gov and get it. It's a 29 page document. Um, that sounds big, but it's really not. Let me explain why. So the FTC says to comply and create your plan. It needs to be applicable to your size, complexity, scope, and sensitivity of your business, right? And so someone that is a huge firm with multiple employees is going to have a pretty big plan. But if you're a solo practice like Ann or someone else, it could be as simple as one page. It could be two pages. There's no prescription here on how complex your plan needs to be. It just needs to make sure that it is covering all the things that you're doing and where your data resides that you're protecting it, that you feel comfortable with, right? And so that's where it's easy to start. And that's why I say those three kind of columns uh, when we talk about physical security and, and so on, administrative, technical, just even getting to those three containers is great. Uh, out there on the website though, when you get there, the first three pages of your WISP, um, what those are is, is an overview of why you need to comply, what you need to do to comply, and then there's a skeleton outline that you could copy and paste into a Word document. And for that matter, just fill in the blanks there on the skeleton outline. So you could go three pages and be done uh, and never read another thing. But what we went further and did is that underneath it, we created a sample template. That simple template is the full legal jargon. It's the full work of what we think, you know, the average WISP could look like. You can take it, copy it out, put your name in. We've got some fill in the blanks there. It has dates and times and signatures and updates, stuff like you can really just take this free document, this free template, irs.gov. I think it's like page seven through 14 or eight through 14, something like that. And you can, you can put it into practice right away, uh, which is really, really nice. And it's free to do. But underneath that, what we do, um, which is really good, is that we then break out each of the definitions. So let's say I don't understand what it means if I need to define what my objectives are, or I don't understand what it means to define my purpose or scope, right? Which are elements that are required in a list. I don't understand that. Well, we have a full training section. So we break each word down. Well, an objective statement looks like this. A purpose statement looks like this. Scope looks like this. Individual responsible party looks like this, right? And so we we explain it. So the rest of the document is training and education for you to build and for you to use for your employees. Um, and then beyond just the WISP, beyond the education that's built into that document, um, well, I'm going to get into the next question here real quick. Um, All right, pulling question number three. Yep. Yay, got time. Go okay, so what what do you perceive to be the greatest security risk to your firm? And again, there's some answers that you can pick and, from. And while people are, are picking that, I want to note that um, a lot of the links that Jared was talking about, these resources, they are available during the webcast uh, um, in the resources tab. And you'll be able to see those those links and, and go visit the websites. Um, we are getting a little bit really, really close to time though. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then we're going to finish up in here and the final little pieces here. And I see we are, we're entering up on time here. Um, drafting policies. One of the things that I want to just let you know, in addition to your written information security plan, uh, you can, there's also policy documents at the very bottom of that WISP, uh, Pub 5708. What those policies are is it just basically states what you're doing to protect data, right? So you, you've documented where the data is at and how it's being protected, but you can create these separate policies that say, you know, 
In my office, we will only have passwords that are nine characters long and we will rotate them every quarter, right? Only employees that I've vetted or if I have background checks have access to data. Uh, and they can only access the data from eight in the morning till five within the physical office or they have remote access. Um, you can define all these different rules so that anyone ever asks you, you can say, here are my rules on how I'm following you to protect data. Um, the last thing that I will probably say is that um, when you want to spot things that are going wrong, there's a couple of signs that we can kind of point to. Um, one of those being, if you go to the irs.gov website and on your e-services account, the IRS tracks how many returns you're filing. If you get a number that is different than what you believe, so maybe you've only filed 10 returns, it says you filed 100, that's a good sign or an indication that something's up. It doesn't mean that a breach has occurred, but it's a good indicator. If returns are starting to reject, and you're seeing them in bulk, right? That says it's already been filed, 10, 15, 20 of your customers. It's a good indicator that something's happened on your system uh, that you should call, first contact the IRS. And that's really what we need to go next, right? Is who do I contact? I'm gonna skip ahead real quick. What do I do if something happens? It's simply this, activate your WISP. Your WISP is there. We've all had crises in our lives. You don't wanna be making it up in a crisis. You wanna have a plan in place for the crisis. And so the first thing you do is contact IRS, your stakeholder liaison. If you believe something has occurred, even if you don't know if it's occurred, if you believe something has occurred, contact your IRS stakeholder liaison and they will negotiate the channels for you. Contact your state department of revenue. And ultimately, if you believe something's happened, your attorney general, most state attorney generals require you to notify them once you've detected a breach has occurred. Um, your local enforcement, IRS or FBI, I mean, uh, contact your insurance carrier if you have a cyber policy or a cyber writer they need to know. Um, and then contact experts. That could be your tech companies. That can be um, your software providers. And then ultimately, if you have the FTC data breach response guide, I would say utilize that, leverage that. Um, and I think that will be something that I would, again, encourage. So again, the FTC response guide for you guys out there, it, uh, it, it's part of the WISP document down at the bottom, but it is really good. And it kind of walks through the steps you need to take. Uh, to be uh, secure. So we're going to move to questions, I think, Isaac. If, if there are some out there, I want to spend a few last minutes on those. Yeah, I think I think one of the things on your last slide, though, Jared, like you yeah. might want to mention again, just to clarify, like, if you do think you have a breach, I mean, you know, we also call our software, like, because they can lock your account and keep it from getting compromised even worse. Yep. Uh, so that would be... Um, yeah, so. your software provider can help with that. So definitely, definitely be in contact. And, and the biggest thing is don't be afraid to, to reach out and to say something. Because if you can stop it faster, I mean, if you know you clicked on an email and you know you did something bad, you know about something just happened to your machine, unplug the network. I mean, that's that's the first right. thing you do, right? Get rid of it. They probably haven't had time to export or exfiltrate data. Right. Having mm -hmm. having something happen versus having data actually leave the premises, those are two separate events, two different conversations you have to have. So uh, but other than that, yeah, contact someone. Don't be afraid. Um, it's better to get it taken care of. Right. Right. Okay. We're, we're getting into the danger zone as far as the webcast. So sure. um, I do want to say that sure. there's a lot of questions and, and Jared and Ann will, will have access to them and hopefully they'll be able to respond to them um, by email. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up right now and, and, we hope everybody enjoyed the webcast. This is definitely a topic that Jared could talk about for two or three hours and Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and and probably as well. And I enjoyed yeah. it as well. Um, but thank you everybody for attending today. And thank you to Drake software for making this event possible and letting us offer CP, free CPE. Um, speaking of devices, my phone was just ringing. I was going to shut it off, but <laughs> anyway, um, um, we do, I think, I, I think we do have a link to, uh, a page, right? Um, I, I think we had a link somewhere in the in the chat yeah, or something. Resources, I, I okay. think. Um, so now attendees will now be presented with a post-event survey. It'll appear on the screen, and then you'll receive your CPE credit by email. Look for a message. It'll come from webcast admin. So check your junk mail if you need to. Um, if you had multiple attendees uh, and you have trouble getting the credit, send an email to editors at cpapracticeadvisor.com. And thanks again, Jared and Ann, and this webcast will now Pleasure. end in three, two, one.